brain melting sessions, at least for me. Uh, I learned quite a lot of stuff. I hope this brings a bit of new stuff or, or gives you a better insight in what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm probably a bit the, the odd one out since you saw the title. I'm talking about uh, VMware vSphere. Uh, first of all, are there many vSphere users in the audience? Okay, oh wow, great. Uh, as you probably know, I'm, I'm quite keen on, on PowerShell and more specifically on, on PowerCLI, which is the, the snap-in and nowadays nearly all modules, but there's still a few snap-ins left, to manage your vSphere environment. Uh, just a minute. Okay, this uh, slide is, is a, a big thank you from the complete PowerShell community and users to the guys who made all of this possible uh, for, it's now 10 years ago, and without them, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't have this marvelous tool to automate and, and manage our environment. So thank you guys, much appreciated. Uh, what am I going to do today here? Uh, first of all, it's, it's four o'clock, so I'm not going to show you hundreds of lines of codes. And I want to avoid the snoring in the room after five minutes and so we'll keep it very light. What I'm trying to go uh, for is uh, DSC, Desired State Configuration, is with something we're all looking at probably. It's very interesting. Uh, there are a number of reasons why you would use that. And my question already some time ago was why wouldn't we use this for our VMware vSphere environment? Now, unfortunately, at the moment, there aren't any public uh, DSC resources available to, that will allow you to do that. And that's where I'm going to try and help or start at least because this is definitely something that will be so huge once it is usable that it's not a one person job uh, so what will happen is i will push some stuff into the community and i hope there will be some participation from the community on uh, setting up dsc resources uh, the agenda it's uh, uh, very straightforward I, i'll just uh, tell you about uh, the, the long and winding road that's in fact uh, especially winding. Uh, although I like all the, the WMF5 previews, uh, I felt often like one step ahead and two steps backwards. Uh, so stuff that you thought was, was implemented, wasn't implemented or didn't exactly work as you expected it to work. But now with RTM I think we uh, reached the stage where we can start actually using this environment, the 5 version, I mean, the, the 4 was already available long before that. Uh, for those, this is a quick uh, introductory stuff, uh, who is this guy on stage? Uh, that's uh, me, Luc, Luc Dekens. I'm from Belgium, uh, so I had a bit of a travel to get here, but okay, we got here in the end. I appear from time to time at VMworld, uh, we have this Power CLI reference for those of you that, that are busy with vSphere, I suppose you know that book. Second edition just came out uh, last February, so the shameless plug, go and get it, uh, but okay, it's up to you. Uh, I'm most of the time, as you can see on the right, I, I put some, some pictures uh, with, with my uh, partner in crime, uh, Alan Renouf, which is probably also well known, who by the way is using his VSHEC module uh, here. Uh, Okay, that's not as much as we know, but okay, great. If you don't know it, you should check it out. It allows you to schedule uh, reports of your complete vSphere environment. Okay, uh, first of all, okay, I saw that most of you are, are aware of vSphere and VMware. Uh, just a bit of history, a one slide, nothing more than that. Uh, PowerCLI was something that they started in 2007. Uh, I was very lucky to get on the early beta. At that time, I think they had about 60 commandlets. In the meantime, the last one that appeared, they have over 600 commandlets. Uh, one of my pet peeves is they still have uh, three snap-ins in there. Uh, all, the rest, all the rest is converted to modules. Uh, in Alan Renouf's excuse, Alan has nothing to do with the remaining snap-ins. That's above his uh, authority. But it will come. They will go uh, module all the way uh, once. Uh, I don't know when, and I'm not working for VMware, so I have no clue about roadmaps and, and so on. Uh, one thing that is quite important, and I, I was very happy that this thing was in there from the first release, that's this get view commandlet. 
Now, get view commandment, most of you will know it because it is the one that, uh, if you're working in larger environments, and I mean uh, thousands of VMs and hundreds of, of hypervisors, uh, you're well off uh, starting to use the, the get view because it performs a lot better than the native, the, the standard command that's get VM and get VM host. But get view has another advantage. It allows you to interface or interact with the complete API that vSphere offers you. So that is the one that allows you to go directly to the objects and the API methods that are available under the covers. What PowerCLI is doing, it's doing exactly the same thing. It's, it's packaging these API calls in commandlets for your easy use. And it makes a selection of the properties that it returns to you. There's a lot more available under the cover. And what PowerCLI and the development team are trying to do there is this 80, 20%. They try to cover 80% of your needs by implementing about, yeah, what is it, 20% of the methods in, in the API. And I think they did a quite good job, okay? Uh, there's 600 commandlets. I think most of the stuff that you do on a day-to-day -day basis can be done with the commandlet. But for this specific environment that we are tackling, or I was tackling the DSC part, I quite soon uh, realized that I had to go to uh, direct uh, API calls, and hence the get view uh, commandlet uh, preference. Now, to give you just a small example, uh, what you can do with GetView, if, if I hope this is a bit readable because I, I try to minimize my code and, and make it large enough. The first uh, screenshot, what you see there, is that uh, we, we extract information for one specific ESXi node. And one of the properties that it returns in this case is the number of CPUs in that uh, VM host. Now, with that information, you don't know if it is uh, one socket with four cores or four sockets, each with one core. But that information is available. It's just not presented through the PowerCLI commandlet. Now, if you get uh, to the API, that's what the second screenshot is doing. It's, it's just a calculated property where we go into uh, the API properties. You can get that information. And that's how we know, okay, this is from a demo uh, environment I was using. It's a, a four socket, one core uh, box that you see there. So, that kind of information, that extra information, uh, you will find by using GetView and diving deep into the APIs and the properties that it uh, presents. So GetView is important for many reasons. Uh, another thing, uh, a high-level view, I didn't know there were so many VMware users in this audience, but still um, I will talk briefly about the thing. This is a very high-level abstraction of, of uh, your vSphere environment. Uh, the top icon on the right, that is the, the famous uh, PowerCLI icon. And what that does is that uses PowerShell, and through PowerShell it addresses this API. That's the box uh, that I called VI API. Underneath you have all your vSphere uh, v servers. Now one thing that you should remember, a vSphere server can be or a vCenter or the pair hypervisor, your ESXi node. Both are called uh, a vSphere server and both, for both you can use the same APIs. That is a big advantage. So you can connect to different environments with the same API methods and find back most of the time all of the same properties. Once you're there, okay, your, your vCenter and your ESXi nodes, they talk with the vKernel, that's where your virtualized hardware is, is uh, translated into physical hardware and your VMs are running also underneath all these vCenter servers. Just a bit of background, it's important to know uh, what we are talking to and who we are talking with. So it's this VI API. Now, why would I uh, consider even uh, looking at uh, desired state configuration for a vSphere environment? I put a number of arguments on, 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 that, uh, on that slide. First of all, vSphere is a very complex environment. If you just look at, at Cluster configuration. Uh, cluster configuration, you have multiple components, you have uh, high availability, DRS, uh, DPM, and so on. Each of these, in turn, has a lot of parameters that you can configure to, mon uh, to control that specific component. So it's a very complex com uh, environment. And then we fall back in the same argumentation why DSC in general is there. It's, it's to monitor these kinds of environments and to correct, autocorrect the drift that you would have on such an environment. Somebody makes a mistake, everybody can make a mistake, it's your junior or your senior admin, they all can make mistakes. So that thing would solve that uh, problem of, of uh, 
changes, unwilling uh, changes to your environment. And then the next realization is, if you look at DSC, DSC it was introduced uh, in four already, but it really expanded the availability and, and the possibilities in five. So PowerShell is there. On top of PowerShell, we have PowerCLI. So everything that we require to start using DSC in vSphere, the tool set, is there. So that is already uh, one big step in, in the good direction. And for me personally, and I think a lot of other people, uh, what is quite important with uh, DSC, you end up with these configuration files, and these configuration files are nothing more than flat text files, which you can put under source control. So you can align your vSphere environment on a specific version, uh, put that under source control, GitHub, uh, Bitbucket, whatever you want. Uh, we even use ClearCase for those who still remember what that is. But you can do it and you can see changes between different implementations of your configuration. So that was for me one of the, the bigger uh, arguments to go for a DSC controlled vSphere environment. Okay, the problem is we mentioned those uh, vSphere servers. It could be a vCenter, it could be an ESXi node. vCenter, the early implementation was quite easy, that was hosted on the Windows box, but not anymore. You now have the choice to go for, for an appliance, the vCSA, it is a Linux box. Secondly, the ESXi node itself is a closed box, you're not supposed to put stuff on there anymore. It's a, for security reasons, but also for support reasons by VMware. So how would we fix that? We need, ultimately, we need an LCM agent somewhere. So my idea was to put a, a box in between, and that is what uh, I call this V-Engine, uh, short V-Eng. What we do there is we uh, install PowerCell, uh, PowerCLI on there, and we install the DSC agent on there. And that is the one that will register itself with the pull server, or push server, whatever you want to use in your environment. That is the client for your DSC configuration. And that one will be using PowerCLI, hence the icon at the bottom there, to talk with your vCenter, so vSphere server. So you avoid that you have to put anything on the boxes in your vSphere environment. That's the first principle that I, I started off. So from there on, okay, I, I recap here uh, quickly the, the argumentation that I already, most of this already uh, was mentioned. Uh, standalone box uh, where we use PowerCLI to talk to the VI API. Uh, the lifecycle transparency. Uh, if you update your vSphere uh, versions, could be vCenter, ESXi, that's transparent from what you do on this vEngine. That is independent. Because ultimately, what the only thing that you have between those two is your DSC configuration. Uh, what you and that is something that I tried to implement from the beginning, but I had some setbacks, uh, but it's still on my planning. Most of you have probably experienced if you run a power CLI script, the first commandlet that you execute, uh, it takes more time than the second one and consecu uh, consecutive uh, commandlet. That has improved in latest versions, but the reason for that thing is, is this just in time compiler that they use. So there are options where you pre-compile, you, uh, you do your engines before you actually start using PowerCLI. Now my idea was, PowerShell has another uh, big uh, thing that was introduced in four, if I'm not mistaken, disconnected sessions. What you can do is you can set up a session, a remote session to your local host. In that session, you load your uh, PowerCLI environment. You do the connection to your vSphere server whatever, be it an ESXi or a vCenter. And then when you're done, your environment is set up, you could even start a dummy first commandlet. When that is done, you disconnect the session. Now once your LCM receives the first configuration, he, starts, he has to start doing stuff. He has to start executing commandlets. Now at that point, he just connects to that disconnected session and everything would be already there. You would have your power CLI loaded, you would have your connection to your vCenter or vSphere server already present. So you would avoid this overhead. Now, I had that implemented, I even have a separate module to uh, manage and, and control such as connected sessions. Unfortunately, we hit the problem where uh, on subsequent, the first call it works perfectly, the first config that you arrive, second config there is a, a WMI error uh, popping up. 
I'm talking with some Microsoft guys here tomorrow, I think, to look further into that problem. But it's still on my planning. Okay. With PowerShell 5 and the DSC options in there, and having lived through all the different previews that we have until we arrived at RTM, I had a few targets that the DSC uh, resources uh, should uh, apply. First of all, it should be class-based. Uh, last year in, at VMworld in August, I already presented uh, some DSC resources, but they were all script-based. And first of all, they are slower. And secondly, they still require the handling of this MOV file, which you would avoid. So we decided, or I decided to go uh, for uh, class-based. That was the first thing. The second thing I wanted, since there are a number of distinct resources in your vSphere environment that you can immediately recognize, uh, data center, folders, clusters and so on, I decided to have a, a resource module that would be comprised of multiple files. Apparently there is an issue with that as well. At the moment you can apparently for Java based classes only use one file, the root module. You can't use multiple files. Multiple PSM ones is apparently not, not available at the moment. So, I had to merge everything back into one big file. Not a big deal, but hard to, to maintain, in fact. Then partial configurations was a target I set myself quite early, although after yesterday and some discussions I had <laughs> in the corridor here, there seems to be some, some, uh, some doubt if that is still a, a valid uh, concept to apply in your environment. At the moment, I'm continuing with partial uh, configurations. I'm still not 100% convinced that it's always bad. So I think uh, I'll stick with it uh, until the opposite is proven. But okay, I'm open for suggestions. And then the, the other concept that I wanted to apply, that's this famous uh, what-where separation. Uh, how you implement the cluster, that, line, that part in your configuration files should be standard. Filling in the actual values, the name of the cluster, uh, what VMs were, uh, what ASX inode should be in there, that should be in a separate part. And that is the part that you could ultimately put under your uh, source control. That is the part that will change between different runs of your uh, DSC configuration. So these were a few of the concepts. I had to drop some temporarily, I hope. But uh, I started working on this thing and this is just a screenshot to give you an idea of my, my lab. Uh, it's not a home lab anymore, it's sitting in the cloud nowadays. So I can access it here, I can access it at home. It's a cloud lab. Uh, the setup is quite simple. I have a very simple uh, Windows environment, uh, one domain controller, one pull server. I have a workstation, I use 10 and 8 to be able to test both flavors of uh, VMF5. And then I have uh, the famous V-Engine and I have a very small uh, separate uh, vSphere environment. In this case it's a VCSA, a couple of uh, ESXi nodes and uh, some storage. I use uh, free NAS at the moment because that's the simplest uh, to set up for me. Okay, most of this is, uh, I already mentioned in the previous slides, it, it was a bumpy road. So, like I said, I often felt that uh, I took one step forward, two steps backwards. And, but there was progress, ultimately there was progress, especially when, when RTM, I5 RTM came available, or available again end of February, that I could continue uh, actually progressing uh, on my DSC resources. Um, most of it, uh, what I mentioned here, is already mentioned on the previous slides. Okay, the virtual, the, this V engine box. Uh, I started uh, configuring that uh, with with a registration key. Uh, I think most of you know, and or if you didn't, you heard it in previous sessions today. Uh, how you can use this registration key. Uh, I think the next slide will show you how. It works with your, okay, so you, you update your web config, you point to this uh, registration keys text, uh, there you put these registration keys. So it simplifies your registration, in my opinion, of your machine, of your uh, DSC client with the pool server. This is just uh, background info. For the rest, it doesn't impact your DSC, vSphere DSC resources normally, but that's how I set it up, just to make it simple, <coughs> what I think is simple. 
Then the partial configurations under discussions, as I said, but uh, what I'm doing there is uh, I tried, and that was one of my arguments to use partial configuration. I, what we noticed, or what I noticed in my environment, that the people who manage your storage and the people who manage your network, they start managing your virtual storage and your virtual network nowadays. And they are not necessarily your virtual environment administrators or otherwise your vSphere administrators. I thought if we pull that apart, it would be easier. The, the network part, how you configure your switches, uh, what settings are on there, that would go to your network team. Same for the storage part. Same for the virtualization part, the virtual servers itself, the clusters and so on, that would go to your virtualization administrators or whatever you want to call them in your environment. So that, hence this separation, but I, this is just a small sample where I have uh, folders and data centers and clusters in separate partial configurations. And thanks to the depends on, we could then determine somewhat what should be there. So you should have a data center present before you define a cluster, if, if your cluster is in that data center, of course. So, those simple uh, dependencies can, can easily be configured in this way. So that's what I was playing and still playing with at the moment. This is, uh, once you launch this to your V-Engine, this is uh, the LCM configuration on that uh, V-Engine. Uh, nothing uh, world shattering in there, it's, it's what you saw several times today, I suppose. It's a, a very straightforward standard thing, uh, configuring LCM. Then the modules themselves. Uh, remember I uh, said that I wanted to go for class modules, class-based mo uh, resources. So I started uh, when, when five, uh, one of the early previews in fact already, I started converting what I had, uh, a scripted resource to uh, classes. Some guidelines that I, but not only for my DSC resources, I use this for, for all my modules and scripts. Uh, I love this region, uh, hash region uh, keyword in, in your code. It allows you to collapse and expand uh, code, makes it more, you, you can have a look from a high level on your code. So that's what I did here. You see, for example, for my class uh, folder, C, okay, and I know that the C at the beginning is also under discussion. I'm, I'm going to review that as well. That one I can understand that that is uh, perhaps a bit uh, surpassed and that I should just call it VMW folder in this case. But what you see is that I have uh, three distinct regions in, in each class. First of all, you have the properties. We will open it uh, on the next slide. Then you have the standard DSC functions, your classical get, set and test. And then what I try to do, and you will see also that in the next slides, is the get, set and test uh, should be rather simple. So a lot of the functionality I packaged in helper functions. That's this third region. Uh, we'll have a closer look at those now. Okay, I hope this is somewhat visible. But this okay, the first part, uh, that's approximately till, I don't know, it's still line 28. That, that's uh, my, my attributes, my properties, parameters that you want, or no, the properties of the class. In this case, for the folder class, there's a number in there uh, that you absolutely need, uh, the ensure, the path, the name, and so on. There's the hidden one. Uh, everybody knows what uh, a hidden uh, property uh, is in a class. You won't see it if, if you uh, use the intelligence uh, thing. The intention of that one is, uh, remember I wanted to use disconnected sessions, that's the one where the session ID would go, in fact. So for the moment, uh, since it's not working, I'm not using it, but that was the intention. Also notice that there are credentials in there, and uh, I know that uh, we, we had a good session earlier, uh, no, first session this afternoon, on, on uh, encrypting your complete move. This is definitely something that I should be looking at. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but we should start encrypting this stuff, because there's quite a lot of security in there. You have your connectivity to your vSphere server. Uh, which you don't want to be seen in public or on the network where everybody can snoop. Then the next region is, is like I said, these set, test and, and get uh, functions. They are quite simple in this case. It, in fact, they only contain the functionality to return the correct uh, result, if they return the result at all. And then you have a number of helper functions at the bottom. That's the third region that I used.
Okay, this is the part where I was sent back uh, quite recently, in fact. Uh, I had the multiple PSM1 files uh, that didn't work out, so I had to go back and start using the, the root module in the manifest and put everything, all my resources, all my classes in one PSM1 file, unfortunately. I hope this is a temporary issue and that it will get fixed at some point. Because for source control reasons, it's a lot easier if I have it in separate files, if I work on the folder class. Now I have to import and, 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 and commit everything again, then I would just be able to do it on the part that I'm actually working with. So if you start using it, uh, or if you start writing it, remember at the moment you can only do it in one PSM1 file, unfortunately. Now, one thing that, that gave me a, a bit of... Uh, issues uh, from the very early start is, is the if you look at, at, at your uh, vSphere environment there's a inventory tree which comprises uh, data centers folders clusters resource pools and so on this complete hierarchy was uh, conceived historically so that means some stuff was added after the initial concept so there are some things in there that are not that logical or that not that obvious how you would reach, for example, look where you can define a folder. You can define a folder, a yellow folder in this case. You can define a yellow folder on the root of your vCenter environment. You can define it on a data center, uh, yeah, on the data, and you can go on like that. Blue folders, on the other hand, which can contain only your virtual machines, you can only define in your VM and template uh, infrastructure. So there's a bit of complexity in there. So and, yeah, before I forget, and on top of that, there are a number of hidden folders that you don't even see in your uh, web client or your vSphere client. Thinking of data centers, VM, host, all these folders will pop up if you do a get folder, but you won't see them in your hierarchy in the client. Now, one question I had to answer. If you want to create a new resource, you have to give a path where it should create this new resource. And, uh, parameter in, in, in the class is of course obvious, that's the part one. But the questions I had to ask there uh, I, and answer more, more particularly is, uh, will I include the hidden folders? Uh, am I going to indicate that home lab is a data center in this case, or am I just going to give the name of the part and, and let my function be intelligent enough to know that it should be a data center? Or look, uh, if it is a data center, is there a possibility that I have a folder with the same name? So in the end, I succeeded in creating a function that can find whatever node in your vSphere hierarchy tree uh, just based on a part like that. Uh, first, let me show you. I made a summary and this is all purpose complex because that's the reality of a, of a vSphere environment. If you look at all the objects in there, uh, and it starts at the top with the vCenter, data center and so on, and, but also all the connectivity in there, a one to n, n to n, folder can be there and there. This is rather complex. Complex means hard to, to uh, automate, hard to program in a script. So this is what I used as, as a starting point to create that all purpose find my uh, node uh, function that I included in the resources. And this is the function, in fact. Uh, it uses some internal helper functions recursively. So I will publish this. I'm not going to run through all these lines. Uh, I know it's four o'clock. I'm the one sitting between you and your dinner uh, in, in half an hour. So I'm not going to uh, torture you any further. But be aware that it's a rather complex function that can handle all these uh, node retrievals that you need. So it can resolve all these parts that you specify in your DSC resource. And there's one other thing that is quite important, and this was a very helpful uh, discovery, uh, discovery feature that I used. What it does, in fact, when it finds the node or the leaf where you uh, in your path, it should return normally or an object or a pointer. The pointers in vSphere, as some of you may know, is called the MoRef, uh, Managed Object Reference, which is a specific uh, object type that comes with power <coughs> supply. If I was going to use that in my basic get, set and test functions, I would have to be including statements with using, because they need to know how this object looks. Now the big thing is that you can convert such a managed object reference to a string. 
And the second big thing is you can use that string on the get view command to retrieve the object. So there's no need whatsoever to use the manage object reference object in your basic uh, class functions like the get set and test. So this was a, a very lucky uh, feature that I could use to my advantage. And that's the example. So uh, this is one. This is from the uh, VM host uh, resource. Uh, this is a helper function. What we're doing is uh, we had the path in the definition in the configuration file. He passes this path to this uh, find uh, VMW leaf function. He comes back with a node. If he finds a node, I need to retrieve the object. So the node is a pointer. If he finds the a node, he needs to retrieve to retrieve the object. And as you saw in the previous slide, this is a string. But thank God. Get view with ID can use a string instead of an actual managed object reference object. So that that was uh, I was quite happy that that was possible. Otherwise, it would be have become a bit more uh, ob uh, obnoxious to, to to code all this. Another thing that I started using quite early is uh, I dropped all use of of the power CLI commanders. And I think I mentioned it earlier. I went. Immediately for the API methods. Okay, API methods. Uh, who of you is uh, using the Onyx web client or has heard of the Onyx web client? So that's the feature where you can see all these API calls underneath the Power CLI commanders. It's a handy feature if you want to write some advanced functions and don't know what they are actually calling. So that is the kind of stuff that you will see appearing if you start using this Onyx web client. So you see all the, the deep down uh, APIs and properties. In this case, what I'm doing here, I'm just adding a, a VM host, an ESXi node, to or a standalone server or one to a cluster. Hence the, the if statement at the end. So based on, on what leaf type was returned, if it's a cluster that was returned, uh, we can use the add host uh, method. If it's uh, not a cluster, it, by definition it is a standalone server, then we need to use this other method with somewhat different uh, parameters. So a lot of the resources that you will see uh, when I make this public, uh, all of them in fact are uh, real API calls and API objects that I'm, I'm using. And the reason I'm doing that is, like I said, is for speed, but also uh, to have more features. Uh, with the API methods, I can do everything. There's a lot. There's some stuff with the, with the commands that is not possible. Uh, what I also used as a guideline, and I think I mentioned the example earlier, if you look at a cluster in a VMware environment, the cluster has uh, multiple components. We have high availability, DRS, DPM. Uh, all of these in turn have a lot of parameters that you can use to configure these components. On the other hand, if you go to the web client or the vSphere client, you can just right click on a data center new cluster. And he doesn't ask you a lot of questions. He just asks you, do you want HA enabled, DRS enabled, DPM, and that's it. So what, what I decided quite early on in, in writing these classes is I would go for the same approach. If you define uh, a resource new cluster in this case, uh, no, not in this case, but if you would define a new cluster, you would get all the defaults. And a configuration of HA or DRS or DPM would be a separate resource with a dependency on the cluster, of course, but I would separate the complexity that way. So that's why I, I call this slide, keep it simple. So I rather work with all these different resources with depend dependencies in between them than making one big resource with, with tens or hundreds of, of parameters, which is quite complex uh, to code and manage. So where am I now? Uh, at the moment, uh, I have a number of, of resources that are uh, tested and available. Uh, that's, those are the ones that I will publish when I'm back home from, from this uh, event. Uh, it's the standard stuff, folder, data center. We have cluster, we have uh, VM host in there, we have data stores in there. There's one component missing that you would need if you want to actually start using it, uh, meaning start creating VMs, that's your network part. Uh, VSS, standard switches, is quite obvious. Uh, those one is under development. Distributed switches is uh, a bit further away in the future, I'm afraid. That is a quite complex object. But it's, it's on my, my to-do list. So what I'm working on at the moment is, is the networking part. 
Uh, like I said, I will uh, publish these uh, quite shortly after I'm back. And since the environment is quite complex, uh, I can't do that all by myself. So what I want to do is uh, publish this, give you an idea how it can be done. So there would, by definition, need to be a lot of, of community effort to, to make this complete, to, to be able to configure your complete vSphere environment based on, on DSC uh, resources in this case. Uh, like I said also in the beginning, I'm not going to show you a lot of code. Uh, I have my ISE editor open. If some of you want to see some of the code or have specific questions, feel free to come up after this session or anywhere in the next coming days. I'm happy uh, to, to run through it and, and discuss with you. Or even, I even know I prefer to listen to your suggestions on how some of this stuff should be done. Uh, quick question here. If, if you have available vSphere DSC resources, how many would consider actually using that? And is that no problem with your environment that they say this is external, uh, we don't trust it, would you have to do a validation? Would you prefer or would you require pester built-in tests? Yes. Uh, yes. Infrastructure testing. So something that made available, if it comes with infrastructure testing, that would be more acceptable than just the resources. Yes? Okay, great. So that's the new point on my to-do list. Then. <laughs> <laughs> or anybody else who wants to volunteer for that part. In fact, uh, that's what I wanted to say in this presentation. There's another one on Wednesday where I will start looking, or where I will look at the reverse part, because a lot of you will have existing vSphere environments. Now, how do you get from an existing vSphere environment to a configuration file? That is the interesting part. We're not going to write, I'm not going to write them from scratch, so that's for Wednesday. And in fact, this brings me uh, to the end uh, of my session for today. Are there any questions? Yeah. Have you got to manage VM themselves, disk expansions, creating VM, things like that? If, sorry, can you? Have you got to manage the VMs themselves, CPUs, memory, gig, uh, disk expansion, things like that? If I write the resource for a VM, yeah, that will, will be a will be. Have you got there yet? No, that's what I said. I first need a network before I can actually create a VM. I know, and I think Brandon is in the audience, he has a resource where you can create a VM. I wanted to start from the bottom up. He started from top down. So that, But I hope that we can reuse some of his code in this environment. Any more questions? Okay, yeah. Do you see this getting rid of the, uh, the need for profiles completely? Post profile. Yeah, I know what, what the question is. Uh, I got this. <laughs> <laughs> is, does this uh, eliminate the need for host profiles? We got that exact same question at uh, VM World, uh -huh. where the question was more painful than when I have it here, of course. In my opinion, and since I'm not working for VMware, yes, this will eliminate your need for host profiles. Because this will do a lot more. <laughs> but my good mate who works for VMware, he will tell you, no, nah, no, not completely. You still will need host profiles. Alan's not convinced? He's convinced of that, but he can't say that you don't need host profiles. <laughs> so, yes, I think if this is working and it's working 100%, you could. Because with host profiles, it's, it's a passive thing. If we get this working, that's an active thing. That's why I would like this monitor and correct. Uh, I don't need to suspect the drift and then take action. I, will this, I want this stuff to dis discover the drift and correct it. And okay. For the correcting uh, mechanism, would you be putting host into maintenance mode, moving VMs? That could be one of the options. Yeah. In fact, what I'm looking at is just writing the resources that would give you that possibility. It would still be you who writes the configuration files, yeah. who decides how far this correction of drift can go. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, I thank you. I know this is the last session of the day. And uh, my brain was melted with the previous one, so I guess some of you would also be very tired now. But, okay, thanks for coming and... <laughs> great.